Hey everybody, it's Matt Fury. Uh, welcome to the Rough Cut Studios here at Avid World Headquarters in Burlington, Massachusetts. Uh, we haven't had a chance to visit in a while. We haven't done a Rough Cut in a little bit. And I thought it'd be nice to do at least something before the year came to a close. And since it is the end of the year and it's a time of reflection and looking back over what's happened over the course of the year, and also a time for um, making way for the new and getting rid of the past, uh, I thought I'd let you join me as I go through about 17 years worth of junk that I've collected here at Avid. Uh, I can't tell you why, it's just something I do. Um, so looking back at 2011, a lot of great things happened for Media Composer. Uh, one of the more significant in version 5.5 and version 6, we added the Artist series of controllers. Now a lot of you might be thinking this is the first time that Avid's really done any sort of uh, control surface uh, hardware, but that's not true. And if you go back uh, to sort of the early days of Avid, you have something like this. And this is what's called the Steenbeck controller. So back before you could buy nonlinear editing at the mall, you basically had two types of film editing. You had the upright style, which was kind of the moviola class of editing machines, and you had the flatbed, which was the Steenbecks or the Chems. So when Avid started out, one of the big challenges was getting editors who weren't familiar with keyboards, you know, they didn't use computers, was getting them to adopt this new disk-based nonlinear editing. And so what we had to do was create this control surface that really reflected what they were used to with their Steenbeck controller. So you basically just had this little shuttle wheel here and a series of buttons for making your ins and outs and jumping around. And this is a prototype. Eventually, the finished version, version looks something like this, which is, which is really cool. Actually, that sucker's mint. I'm gonna hang on to that. Even though I said I was gonna throw stuff out, I think I'm, I'm keeping this one. So these are the Steenbeck controllers and really one of the first efforts that Avid had in terms of uh, offering up a control surface. From there, it got even a little more complicated. Um, some of you may have seen those before, but you might not have seen this next piece. This is called the Avid Droid. So George Lucas, the Howard the Duck guy, actually had a nonlinear editing system of his own called the Edit Droid, and it used, um, used laser disks as the source material. And it was pretty cool, but they looked at uh, Media Composer and thought, okay, well this is the right way to go. So they partnered up with Avid and said, you know what, okay, we're done with the Edit Droid. Here's some technology that we're using, and see if you can adopt that. So what Avid did is came out with this control surface called the Avid Droid, and you can see it's got some of the same Steenbeck style quality, but also introduced this, uh, this trackball. Now something that was a little more popular, and you can see why, because it came in this very stylish purple case, uh, was this guy here. This is another control surface. And again, you had the uh, little shuttle surface and this control unit. So for those of you at home saying, oh, I know what that is, that's the MUI, um, no, you're wrong. It's the Maui, um, but apparently there was some sort of copyright problem with uh, the state of Hawaii and Avid ended up changing it to the MUI. Um, this one actually caught on a little bit and was around for a while, um, but you don't really see it anymore. Okay, so I know some of you have seen that stuff. I can guarantee none of you have ever seen this. Um, this guy right here, I have no idea what this is. It's a prototype. Um, again, you can see a lot of the same elements the uh, Steenbeck style shuttle, the trackball. Now we have a keypad for doing numeric uh, entry. And then over here, I'm not sure what this was gonna be, but it's a little, um, little screen with some buttons. So you can see all kinds of crazy stuff happens behind the scenes at Avid that never really makes it to the, um, to the marketplace. Um, but this was pretty cool. Um, again, probably something else I shouldn't throw out. All right, what else do we have here? All right, check this out. Uh, Avid wasn't the only one doing control services. We had a competitor uh, a while ago called uh, iMix, and they made a product called the Video Cube. And again, you see the little uh, jog shuttle wheel, and they actually incorporated some faders. After a while, iMix became Cytex, and they had this Stratosphere product. The big deal with iMix and then Stratosphere and, and Cytex was um, effects. Their big thing was, was being uh, really good at manipulating uh, effects in the editor, as well as using a compression called wavelet compression, as opposed to the motion JPEG that a lot of other people were using. And uh, they're not around anymore, so I'm just gonna put that over there. Um, speaking of competitors, let's see what else I've got here. See if any of you remember this. This is a breakout box from Media 100. I don't know what I'm doing with that. But a pretty good representation of what was happening a lot of the time. You had a uh, a host card going in the computer, and then uh, a snake or a breakout box for all your I.O. connections. You know, hey, if Media 100 was your thing, Boris Yamnitsky over at Boris FX is still doing a yeoman's job of keeping that thing going, but um, I have no use for that. 
Okay, ah, this is kind of cool. Now, when Avid started out, the video hardware that Avid used was built by a company called TrueVision. First, there was the NuVista video card, and then there was the Avid Broadcast Video Board, or ABVB. And TrueVision actually made the core components of those. And then when Avid got into developing a Windows-based product, we actually used an off-the-shelf card from TrueVision and this breakout box. I think this was called the RCX 2000 or something like that. And it went in a product called um, MCXNT. So you started seeing more and more of these. In fact, building on this, let's see if I can do this without breaking my neck. Uh, TrueVision came out with this product called the Modris, and this was even more complex. You could use it as a standalone transcoder or as a front end for, just like the RCX, a, a, a breakout box. I'm going to kill somebody if I throw this. I'm just going to gently set this down over here. What else? All kinds of cool stuff. You know, in the early days, let's see here. Um, going back to control surfaces, MIDI and ADB played a huge part in external connections. There's a company called JL Cooper, and I know they're still around. But they had all these cool little boxes that were basically their whole purpose was for controlling your Mac, and they did that via MIDI connections. So you had, you know, in this case, you've got your motion control series or station, which was, again, jog shuttle. Got your faders. And if you want to connect your keyboards up for Pro Tools, you'd need something like this. Um, heads up. OK. Speaking of Pro Tools, if you ever use Pro Tools, you probably had one of these. This is a Timeline Microlinks. And basically what it was, it was a way of connecting up your DEX or your DA88 to Pro Tools. Early on in nonlinear editing and in digital audio workstations, one of the big challenges was capturing signals and converting audio to digital. And so you had big um, external hardware just for that, like the old uh, timeline. Um, yeah, speaking of, on the video side, something very similar, you had the VLAN. And what this did, it was basically a front end going between your Avid and your source decks, because back then the protocols weren't really worked out too well in terms of deck control. So you'd use this big unit here, and you'd, I think this still comes off. It's been about 18 years since I've touched one of these. There are a series of dip switches. There we go. So inside there is a series of dip switches you would set for whatever type of deck you were controlling. And in this case, you could have two different decks. So a nice solution for controlling all these different decks that are out there when Avid and the manufacturers didn't quite have a set protocol and have the templates all worked out for deck control. What else have we got here? Um, OK, getting back to Pro Tools and Avid. So one of the early uh, interfaces that Avid used for Media Composer was from a company called Digidesign. And it was uh, these two boxes right here, the ominously named uh, Video Slave Driver and the 442 unit. Basically what they were designed to do was to connect up your audio sources, sync them to your video sources, and bring all that happiness together inside Media Composer. Uh, in fact, um, Media Composer relied so heavily on these and Avid thought so highly of um, what Pro Tools was going to become that Avid acquired Digidesign. And then from there, they just basically put a nice new paint job on the 442 and the Video Slave Driver. And curiously enough, the word Digidesign um, doesn't appear on there anymore. Um, let's see, what else have we got? Uh, I like this one a lot. The Avid Media Reader. Now, this was cool. This was something that was developed by Everts. In film projects, what you would do is you would transfer your film to tape using a process called Telecine. And when they did that, they would embed metadata, um, key code information, time code information, into the time code track in the VTC or LTC streams. And if you don't know what those are, you should, you should really look that up. And then you would hook this up to your media composer or your film composer. And when you were capturing from tape, it would decode those streams. And basically, you could just let the whole thing record on the fly. And it would subclip automatically for you. It would capture the, the clip information. And it would even do burn-ins for you. So if you were doing film projects, this thing was, um, this thing was invaluable, which is probably why I still have it. OK, oh, this is one of my favorites. You couldn't possibly come up, with, come up with a more basic, rackable piece of hardware. This is the single deck switch. Sync issues and signal routing and all that stuff, that was a big deal. So basically, you just have a single switch here, depending on whether or not you were digitizing or doing a digital cut. And that one I can 
that was a good shot. Um, okay, what else? How about a little, um, oh, I remember this, um, black burst generator. I mean, you had to have this uh, to keep your decks and your media composer and everything else in sync. Otherwise, it's just, uh, well, it wouldn't work right. Um, okay, how about a little storage? That's always fun. The IS18 Pro. Um, this is an 18 gig hard drive. 18 gigs. It's pretty heavy. Actually, there were bigger ones than this. I think there were 250 megs, and then 500 megs, and then a gigabyte, and then they got up to nine gigs, and then the form factor got down to this size, which was at the time was considered relatively small. This would have been in the mid-90s, 95, 96. And so you had these in nine gigabyte, 18, 36, and then 73, and I think 73 was the biggest size this got up to. And it used a SCSI connection. SCSI was a, or still is a protocol for, um, for storage. In fact, I got this guy too. Ooh, boy, talk about heavy. Um, this is the uh, DLT, Digital Linear Tape. And basically what this was, was a tape backup unit. So you'd use what was relatively low cost um, digital linear tape that you'd pop in here and you'd back up your projects to this tape and then you put the tape on the shelf and everybody was happy. And this guy also used SCSI. You had SCSI and Ultra SCSI and Differential SCSI, um, which is a pretty horrible name, so it's probably a good thing that SCSI is going away. And really look at it, SCSI versus Thunderbolt. From a marketing standpoint, um, we really didn't have our act together back then. And when I say we, I mean the industry at large. Uh, heads up. Okay. Moving right along. Let's see here. Uh, this is a good one. A little history lesson. You know what this is? Well, it's a Mac, but it's not made by Apple. Back in the mid-90s, Apple was being run by a guy, a guy named Dr. Gil Emilio. And one of his ideas, or Apple's ideas at the time, for expanding their footprint was to allow cloning, um, or allow uh, competitors to use uh, the Mac OS on their clone systems. So this company, Power Computing, right here, actually built a Power Mac that ran the uh, Macintosh operating system. Probably back then it was System 7, System 8. And one of the interesting things about that was not only could it run the Mac software, it could also run what was called the BOS. There was a competing third uh, operating system at the time that was really targeted just at um, video professionals and multi multimedia professionals. And the company BOS was run by a guy named Jean-Louis Gasset, who was an original Apple executive. And his idea at the time was to get Apple to, uh, I believe, buy out BOS or at least adopt the BOS as their new operating system. So they were negotiating over that. And while that was going on, um, the Apple board of directors, I believe, decided, hey, this company Next Step, or Next, has this cool operating system called Next Step. And oddly enough, a guy named Steve Jobs was running that company. So what they did is they blew off uh, Jean-Louis and the BOS, and they brought Jobs back in as their, as their leader. And um, Next Step became the foundation for OS X. And then Jobs used Apple stock to buy up power computing and kill off all the clones. So how about that? Um, this is one of my favorite little things. Along this time, there were these Power Mac computers, and, and the mechanics of them really weren't great. They were little tower computers. There was like the Power Mac 8100, the 9500. And most nonlinear systems, and Avid is no exception, relied on internal boards going into the computer to do um, a lot of the processing. Problem was, the way the computers were built, that getting the boards in and out of the slots was pretty dangerous. It was like running your knuckles over a cheese grater. So one of the Avid field engineers, who was just probably tired of doing this for the millionth time, fabricated this little piece of plastic. And the way it worked was you just basically jammed it into the computer between the PCI cards. It had these little plastic tabs holding everything together. So you'd push that in, it would separate the tabs for you, and you could easily take out um, the boards without ripping the skin off your knuckles. And uh, he showed this to everyone at Avid, and they thought, wow, this is cool, so let's mass produce these and call it the board extractor tool and slap a part number on it. And no, Avid didn't charge for this, I don't, I don't believe. But it was affectionately called the Mangu, because the guy that fabricated it originally, his last name was Mangu. Um, but really, no need for that anymore. And uh, no need for this either. Um, in fact, Avid never qualified this. I don't know why I have it, but whatever. Okay, moving on. Oh, this is good. You know, in 17 years at Avid, I've collected a lot of little toys and giveaways and stuff like this. Here's the Avid DS lighter. How many of you have one of these? Um, really not much to say about that. It's a 
$300 million Zippo. Um, I actually think I'll keep that. Okay, so let's get back to hardware Avid did qualify, in fact, make themselves the Meridian hardware. Much like the 442, you had uh, an eight channel audio IO unit, and then that was connected to this big uh, breakout box uh, for the video processing. And this was standard F only, and um, a big hit, because it really, it worked well, and people loved it, and it was solid, and what more can you ask for? And then building on from that, oh boy, it's getting scary over there. Last but not least, ugh, nitrous. The Nitrous Classic, and this is the first, um, along with Adrenaline, the HD unit provided for real-time HD processing, all the in and outs that you'd want, and you definitely still see a lot of these out there in the marketplace. And I think that's it for all my toys. I think I've covered everything. Thanks for taking this little trip down memory lane with me. I hope you enjoyed it. You might not have learned anything, but I hope you had a little fun. And uh, come back and visit us again next year. Hopefully we'll have more interviews with customers, more tutorial videos, all that stuff you've been asking for. And I hope you have a great holiday season and uh, we'll see you next year.